Good morning, everyone. It is Sunday morning, August the 16th. It's nine o'clock and time for the Rouge Free Will Baptist Church online Sunday school. And my name is Charlie, and I am joined today by my wonder dog, Sasha, and my wife, Rhonda, is with me today, and she will be acting as my spotter, and uh, we will also be giving us some historical documentation. We are in the sixth church of the Church of Philadelphia, so our study takes place in the book of Revelation, chapter 3, verses 7 through 13. And so we are glad to see all of you coming on and joining us today. I have been looking forward to this study, and good morning to all of you that are joining us. Uh, I have been looking forward to the study of these next two churches, but also uh, there's a little dread there too, because as we get into these churches now, uh, the, the historical past of the Roman Empire and the beginnings of the Lutheran Church and the Protestant Church, and the Catholic Church, and the Holy Roman Empire, and the Roman Catholic Church are all behind us now. And now we're getting into more familiar territory, where historically many of the names you will now recognize, and we're getting, when we get into the Laodicean Church, we will, we will be right in our own backyard. And so it's important, especially from this moment on, that you not only take these as uh, historical documentation, these churches, and remember that they are actual churches. And uh, excuse me just a moment, I got something bugging me. They are not just, act they're actually churches that are current. They're taking place. They are holding service while John <laughs> is writing the book of Revelation uh, back in 80, 95, 96. But the, but the revealed Christ is also using these seven churches to look at what are the seven church ages that will exist between the time of the early church and the rapture of the church. And so now we are getting into that familiar territory uh, that you've probably in, in school learned about. We're in from 1750 to 1900 this week. And so... You need to, to not only apply these to these churches that existed and the church ages, but you need to apply them to your current church and to yourself as an individual, because we're going to be talking about some things that really have an application to this current day. Remember, every church has a characteristic and every church age has characteristics that will carry down through the ages right to our present day as we are here in the Laodicean age, but awaiting the rapture of the church. And so that's why it's important for you to really buckle down and listen to the words of the revealed Christ in this church of Philadelphia that was an actual church, and Rhonda's going to come in just a second, and talk to us about the history of the Philadelphia Church and of Philadelphia. But uh, it is also coming right down. The characteristics of this church are coming down into the Laodicean age as well. So I welcome all of you. It's good to have you. And so I hope you have your Bibles ready and your outlines ready. Uh, Revelation chapter 3 verse 7. And so before we go any further into the study, I'm going to ask my wife, Rhonda, to come and talk to us about the Church of Philadelphia at the time and before and just prior to the history of the Church of Philadelphia and the city of Philadelphia. So we're going to make that exchange right now if we can get Sasha out of the way. <laughs> she doesn't want to move. Sorry, I have to maneuver over her. So um, the Church of Philadelphia is 27 miles to the east of Sardis in um, Asia Minor, which is now Turkey. It was founded in 189 BC uh, by the last king of Pergamum, and his name was King Eumenes. And Eumenes founded the city for his brother Attalus. 
And um, the reason he did that was because he loved his brother dearly. So Philadelphia's name comes from the ancient Greek um, phylos, which means beloved or dear, and adelphos, which means brother or brotherly, and hence the name the city of brotherly love. Um, Philadelphia was surrounded on all sides by volcanic cliffs, which made the land very, very fertile. Um, and the land was so fertile that it was known for its grape vineyards and for the production of wine. And um, it was so famous that the, the Roman poet Virgil wrote of the excellence of the wine from Philadelphia. And it was also known for hot springs. So it had many hot springs because of the volcanic activity all around it. And people came from far and wide to visit these hot springs um, because they were known for their supposed curative properties. And um, it was the volcanoes that actually was, that led to its undoing, but we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, Philadelphia was also known for education of the central regions of Asia Minor. It was created to teach um, the laws and the religion and the language of the Pergamum Empire, uh, which at that time was Greek. And as we know from uh, earlier studies, um, the translation of the Bible from Hebrew to Greek was key in getting that uh, infallible word of God out to the common people and not keeping it so cloaked in mysticism where only the priests um, knew what the word said. So Philadelphia played a key part in um, perpetuating the word of God and getting it out there. And um, so it was, it was known as a missionary city and its mission was to teach. And it did a fantastic job of it. Um, there's writings by different historians that say that, per, that uh, Philadelphia was so successful in its teaching and missionary efforts that um, the Lydian um, Empire actually forgot their own language and began speaking Greek exclusively, which is, again, key to, to getting that word out there because if they're, if they're not able to understand, how can they, how can they hear the right and true uh, words of God? And there's many historical writings um, speaking about the city and its characteristics and, and all the ones that I found um, actually speak of that spirit of brotherly love and faithfulness and perseverance. Um, because it was situated on a major highway, if you will, um, a roadway uh, or a trade route to the interior of Asia Minor and to the other coastal cities. I mean, you could go forward into the Lydian capital in the east and back to westward towards Sardis and Ephesus and Pergamum. So it was a major thoroughfare. Um, it was known as the doorway. Um, and Jesus speaks of it as the open door. So that's, that's, uh, that's pretty interesting. It was also known as Little Athens um, because it did have some opulent pagan temples. But Philadelphia also housed a synagogue, a very large synagogue, um, where there was a uh, Jewish faction, if you will, um, that really warred against the Christians. But the Christians persevered. They would not give up on the true word of God. And there's historical evidence of that friction and perhaps even persecution um, from the Jewish population towards the Christians. In 17 AD, the city was destroyed by an earthquake which was spawned by the volcanic um, activity in the area and it destroyed a total of 12 cities including Sardis and Pergamon and um, parts of Ephesus and Sardis and at Philadelphia were almost completely destroyed but the city was rebuilt by the Roman Emperor um, Tiberius because Philadelphia had been willed by Eumenes to the Roman Empire upon his death in 133 BC um, because he had no direct heir to will his empire to. So that's how Philadelphia came under Roman rule. Um, even though Tiberius, what he did was he deferred all taxes and duties and levies so that the city could be rebuilt, and it was rebuilt, and it was rebuilt um, just as opulent as it was before. However, because of the aftershocks that continued, historical writings say for decades, 
And um, the historian Strabos, three years afterwards, says that the aftershocks are constant. There are constant earthquakes and that the people of the city have taken to living outside the city proper in tent cities because the walls cracked from these earthquakes and they're afraid to live within the city because so many died in that original earthquake. Um, but the city did go on and and it persevered and it continued to be a missionary city even after the devastation. So um, the characteristics that are all written about, I mean, Virgil writes about it, Strabos, Tacitus, even Pliny the Elder who are um, known as very uh, prolific writers of history at that time, they all write about the perseverance of the city of, of Philadelphia and its indomitable um, desire to continue, even if it's in a different fashion than it continued before. So uh, Philadelphia is extensively written about. There's a lot of history on it, and it seems to be uh, a very important city to the spreading of God's word, and they did not stop. So that's what I have for you. Thank you, dear. So you can understand by what Rhonda explained to you uh, that why Jesus, this revealed Christ in the in the Bible, will use some of the terminology that he uses, especially one of the things is the open door. Uh, he will speak extensively about that. So before we go any further, and as more of you are coming on, I want to uh, have prayer with you, and then I'm going to give you uh, uh, Dr. Graham's uh uh, devotion for the day, and then we will get right into the lesson. So if you would, bow your heads with me. Heavenly Father, as we bow in your presence this morning, we give you thanks and honor and glory, Lord, for this beautiful morning. We thank you, God, for the rain. We thank you for the weather. We thank you for our homes. We thank you for our church. You are an almighty God, and we just worship you and thank you for the goodness that you give us every day of our life. As we look into the, your word today, God, I just pray that the Holy Spirit will lead and guide and direct and that you will be glorified and honored by everything we say and do. And may all of our, all of our worship and all of our praise rise to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So let's, uh, let's just look briefly here at the devotion of the day. I like doing that. I started doing this so I didn't uh, to keep you going since I'm here seven days a week. Today is August the 16th, and so to Dr. Graham's devotion today is fervent prayer. And it says, if my people will pray and seek my face, I will hear from heaven. That's 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. And this is what Dr. Graham says today. From one end of the Bible to the other, there is the record of those who, whose prayers were answered, men and women who turned the tide of history by prayer, who fervently prayed, and God answered. Elijah prayed, and God sent fire from heaven to consume the offering on the altar he had built in the presence of God's enemies. Elisha prayed, and the son of the Shumanite woman was raised from the dead. Hannah prayed, and God gave her a son. Samuel, who would bless God's people for decades. Paul prayed, and dozens of churches were born in Asia Minor and Europe. Peter prayed, and Dorcas was raised to life to have added years of service for Jesus Christ. Their prayers were the natural outflow of their deep inner faith. Their prayers were part of a greater whole. Godly lives lived for God's glory. As the 17th century theologian John Owen said, he who prays as he ought will endeavor to live as he prays. So that is a great devotion, and I thought that was really just awesome, and I wanted to share that with you this morning. All right, let's read what the Word of God says in the King James Version in Revelation chapter 3, verses 7 through 13. And here is what 
the angel of the is written to the angel of the church in Philadelphia. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia, write, These things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth and no man shutteth, and shutteth and no man openeth. I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it, for thou hast a little strength and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews, and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet, and to know that I have loved thee. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out. And I will write upon him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God, and I will write upon him my new name. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Now, for those of you who have your NIVs, or a similar, I'm reading, this is from the NIV, so you can see uh, some of the more Americanized words. To the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These are the words of him who is holy and true, who hold the, holds the key of David. What he opens, no man can shut, and what he shuts, no one can open. I know your deeds. See, I have placed before you an open door that no man can shut. I know that you have a little strength, yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. Pardon me, I'm being passed a note here. Oh, we just got a note that Brother John Cheek passed away. And so thank you, for Brother Tom, for passing that on. John doesn't, uh, is not a member of our church, but he has uh, been a participant, I will tell you, an active participant. And he has been suffering uh, the last few years and even had part of his leg amputated. So please pray for his wife, Mary, and their family. John Cheek has gone to glory to be with his Lord. So heaven is celebrating while we mourn his passing. God bless you all. So I, so I will make of those, in verse 9, I will make those who are of the synagogue of Satan, who claim to be Jews, though they are not, but are liars, I will make them come and fall down at your feet and acknowledge that I have loved you. Since you kept my command to endure patiently, I will also keep you from the hour of trial that is going to come on the whole world to test the inhabitants of the earth. I am coming soon. Hold on to what you have so that no one will take your crown. The one who is victorious, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God. Never again will they leave it. I will write on them the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which is coming down out of heaven from my God. And I will also write on them my new name. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says, says to the churches. So that is a, this is, uh, so as we kind of look at that, you see the verses, you can understand what they say. That's why I like to read them in both versions to Americanize it just a little bit, especially for our younger uh, audience that are listening that are not used to the ancient King James uh, language. So let's look at this and just kind of um, surmise what is happening at this church. First of all, the this is, a, again, this is an active church that is going on in AD 95, AD 96, when John is writing the book of Revelation on the Isle of Patmos. 
But this is also the sixth church age. And this church age seems to cover about AD 1750 until the year 1900 and will extend the characteristics of it. Some of it will extend right to the rapture of the church. And so Christ commends this church and says to them, I know your works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. For thou hast a little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. So he's saying to this church, here are the things you're doing right. I've looked at your deeds. I've looked at your works. And here's what I see. I am so pleased with you that I have set before you an open door. And this, we'll talk about this in a couple of minutes a little more extensively, but this will set about what we know today has been the Great Migration, and it is also the great moving out and the missionary work of the church that will be completely vital at this time. Doors will be opened. Just think about the years that we're talking about, 1750 to 1900. So what's going to happen in those years historically? Well, one of the great things is, is America is going to be um, discovered. We are going to separate from Britain. We will fight the Revolutionary War. And one of the things we will fight for is the right to have freedom of worship. But out of that will not only be this country, America, that will come along that's going to historically pay a great uh, opportunity for the nation of Israel, which at this time, during this period, is scattered to the wind and doesn't even really exist. Israel has gone to the four winds, and the, and the nation of Israel has been scattered, and they're not even really recognized at a nation as a nation at this time period. But God has set into motion some great things that will open doors that will allow the day to come when the nation of Israel will be called back. And we're going to talk about this a little more in a few moments because there's some exciting and uh, very, very illuminating things happening in Israel right now. And it's being covered up a little bit by all that we're going through with COVID-19 and our social unrest around the world. But never forget, the hand of God is moves throughout time. You can see the finger of God moving throughout history if you'll just pay attention to what's going on. So the discovery of America, the founding of America, I should say, is more like it. The founding of the American continent is huge in Bible prophecy and with the re reclamation of the nation of Israel. Israel will almost get what you would call a second home, certainly a partner in prophecy. So you know, I know your work and I've set before you this open door. I know you've got a little strength, but you've kept my word and you have not denied my name. Um, condemnation, not one word. Jesus has no condemnation of this church age. What they are doing and what they are done, does that mean everything was right? No, it does not. But he sees their, their, their love for humanity, he sees their love for Christ, he sees their love of God, and what they are willing to do for the glory of God, and he does not issue one word of condemnation to this church. That is amazing. He counsels them and says, Behold, in verse 11, Behold, I come quickly. Hold fast. There's that term again. Hold fast to what you have, that no man take thy crown. In verse 11, and then he challenges them in verse 12 and 13. Him that overcometh, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out. And I will write upon him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem. New Jerusalem is built 
for the Gentile nations of God. That is our home. The earth belongs to the Jewish nation, which we'll get into as we go through those prophetical chapters, which cometh down out of heaven from my God, and I will write upon him my new name. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. This is an age, excuse me, I'll have a sip of coffee because I'm getting way too excited and I need to calm down. So this is an age that is coming out of the church. We, uh, we talked to of Sardis, where the word of God, because of the works of reformers like Martin Luther and other reformers that were with him, have, in, have, have lit the flame, that flicker of light that has brought the word of God to the general public and to the laity. He didn't do everything right, and there's a lot of condemnation on the church of Sardis, but just like Sardis came out of the church of Thyatira, the works of the church of Philadelphia will come out of this church of Sardis because the word of God has been revealed and something else will come of that, and that is they will begin to start preaching and teaching the second coming of Christ again. A subject that has been dead for three centuries is now alive, and we are now talking about the second coming of Christ. And again, how important this is, is because the church, as you notice in the churches previous to this, did not live separated lives because they did not fear the second coming of Christ. They believed because of the teachings of the Roman Catholic Church that the, that the, uh, the kingdom of God had already come and already been set up on the earth and there was no more coming. But now the word of God has revealed to the common folks and to common people that the second coming has not happened. Jesus is still coming, and they start preaching that, and folks start separating themselves again and living holy lives. But I want to move on. This also, in this time period, some of the greatest revivals. You see, when God opened the door, these people will step through it. So what will happen is, some of the greatest revivals we've ever heard of by George Whitfield, Charles Spurgeon, D.L. Moody. I'm not talking about revivals that lasted for a week. I'm talking about revivals that would last for weeks, for months. These men of God would be called of God to go to these various continents and preach the gospel and to preach it. No microphones, no PA systems. Yet their voices would ring loud and clear across the prairies, across the deserts, across the forest land, and thousands of people would show up to hear George Whitfield in England preach the gospel. D.L. Moody in America to preach the gospel. Bars would close down on Sunday because the convicting power of the Holy Spirit was so great. These were revivals that swept the world. Not only that, but men, because the Bible is now being given to the laity and given to everyone, young men are taking every word literally. And so when they read to go out and preach the gospel to every creature, they take that literally. And so men like William Carey, who is probably the very first, what we know as the modern day missionary, will leave his home and go to India. He will be the, uh, now, I will tell you that centuries before, the Apostle Thomas will travel after the resurrection of Christ, will travel to India. And Thomas is still known today in the nation of India as the first missionary to their country. But this has been long years past, and now William Carey will stand up and go to India. He will forsake all of his worldly goods, all of his life, and devote it to Christ and go to India 
to preach the gospel. And young men after young men will follow him into the mission fields all over the world. It is during this age that God opens up. It's this door that Jesus said, I'm going to open. And when I open it, no man can shut it. But when I shut it, no man can open it either. It is what is talked about in the church of Philadelphia, this amazing church that will not only bring the gospel to the entire world, but will give everything. And Rhonda talked about the uh, Jewish uh, synagogue and, and the church at Philadelphia, and there will be persecution from the Jews. There'll be persecution from the Greeks. There'll be persecution from the Romans. But they have now have the word of God, and they have it in their own hands, and they are not giving up or letting go. This is just amazing. Now, I want to read something to you, and then I'm going to make a statement that I dread to make. Because it is not only heart-wrenching and heartbreaking for me personally, but for this age for our age today. Clarence Larkin in his book, which is one of the books where the book of Revelation by Clarence Larkin said this in 1919. The Philadelphia period covers the time between AD 1750 and AD 1900. We must not forget that the characteristics of all these periods continue on in the church down to the end. This is true of the evangelistic and missionary movements of the Philadelphia period, but they are now more mechanical and based on business methods, and there is less spiritual power. This will continue until Christ returns. That is a profound statement made by Clarence Larkin. And what I'm about to say goes against the entire grain of my own denomination and of denominations around the world. Why? Because, and I've heard this said, and it's true, listen, churches pay bills, we're an organization, uh, we are a business, there's no doubt about that. We have, we have money comes in, money goes out, uh, we have events, we have structure, but what we forget is not only is the church an organization, but it is a living organism led by supposedly the Holy Spirit. What's the difference? The difference is this. These men did not wait for an organization or a structure or a modern method to send them where they went. They simply felt a pulling of the Holy Spirit and urging from God to do something, and they did it. And while I'm not knocking, I'm not really knocking anything, I think that, and, and what has carried on to our very age today, is that we now somehow believe, as free will Baptists, as Methodists, as, Pro as Protestants, as Catholics, that we somehow have made, have to, uh, have a, week, a young man cannot answer his calling unless he follows these ports. You know, you've got to do X, Y, Z. You've got to do A, B, C. You can't really answer the call to preach if you don't spend four years in Bible college. Am I against Bible college? I am not. I believe that absolutely you need to be trained. Uh, we cannot send you unless you go raise money to go. I'm going to tell you that William Carey did not travel the country raising money before he went to India. I'm telling you, William Carey felt the burning in his heart that God wanted him to go preach in India, and the Holy Spirit pulled him, and he went and left everything behind. And so you say, well, you're not. No, I'm not. I, I understand what they're trying to do. I understand that everything, that, that, that the, the, the justification of the way we run our systems today, but what we're missing and what, doc, and what Dr. Larkin is saying here is, 
We're doing this under a mechanical structure, and there is no moving of the Holy Spirit, and there is no spiritual power. And so we're falling flat on our faces because we have left this. We have left the spiritual power. We have left the leadership of the Holy Spirit because God is the only one, the only one who can open that door. Now we can support and we can help to educate, but that is not the calling of God. And I'm sorry if that goes against what you may think. But listen, you've often heard preachers say that they fought the calling of God. And I do not doubt that because it's an awesome calling, all right? But I'm also telling you that the scripture is clear that if a man desires, listen to that word, if the man desires the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. No one is called to preach the gospel unless they feel that burning in their soul. Now, they may fight that. They may say, I don't, Lord, I don't want to do that. I'm not ready for that. I'm not capable. Yeah, I understand that. But that doesn't mean they don't desire it because as, as uh, Francis, Sa uh, Sa Francis Schaeffer once said, when the spirit burns, a man is consumed. And I will tell you a, a story, and I'm gonna, and I and I know I got a, but uh, uh, and my aunt Ruby's on here right now, and I know that I'm and I'm coming from my memories as a child, uh, as a young man, and so I know that we'll have a conversation about that, and I can't wait to have it. But my uncle Carl Mullins was, a, and as a child, this is my childhood memories and the stories that I heard was a truck driver living in Romulus, Michigan, right by the airport on Middle Belt Road, a bend of the house. I had actually a vision in his house as a young boy. I'll tell you about that later. But one day, to make the long story short, Carl felt this pulling in his heart, and he left his truck and started walking and hitchhiking and walking. This is back in the 50s and 60s. 1950s, 1960s, left his wife, left everybody. My Aunt Helen, I can't even imagine how she felt. Until he got to Phoenix, Arizona. Now, this is before Phoenix was Phoenix. And it seemed to be when he got there, I remember the story going that he called my Aunt Helen, said, pack up everything we've got. I'm going to send you some money you're coming to Phoenix. And she listened. They end up, my Uncle Carl ends up as a missionary on an Indian reservation out there where he stayed the rest of his life. And not only did God call him there to minister and to, those, to that Indian nation on those reservations out there in Arizona, but he supplied a living for him. Before Phoenix was Phoenix, he got into pest control. And, well, you can imagine, as Phoenix grows, so did his business. And he and so God not only gave him the work that he wanted him to do, but he supplied his living to do it. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine anyone doing something like that today? That's because, folks, we do not, this age, this age that we're looking at, God opens doors and young men listen to the call and they go. They don't ask questions, they just go. Just like the early church, just like Peter and Paul and all the apostles, when Jesus called, they left what they had and they went. Today, we're far too mechanical, even to the point today where you, you've heard pastor talk about it, trying to get a youth minister or trying to get some help for our church. And the wages that, that young men are asking for today to come work in your church as ministers of the gospel are just outrageous. I'm sorry if I offend you, I hurt your feelings. It's outrageous. What about the men of God in the 50s and 60s that were working in the factories and the fields and God called and they just simply decided to start a church in the middle of Detroit or the middle of Chicago and they started in storefront buildings and they preached the gospel and God added 
And today, you don't see that anymore. Tommy says the desire is the first qualification. Amen, Tommy. That is true. And that's what the point I'm trying to get across. You can say you fought the calling of God to preach, but I'm telling you, inside you, you had a burning from the Holy Spirit. That's missing today. And so is the power. So let's move on. Just wait. That's what he's talking about, about this open door that God has opened that the gospel can reach the entire world. And he calls men from England and America to fill these positions. But today, we, you know, ask one of us to go start a church in a storefront building in Detroit and see what response you get. Sandra Kelly says no one will just get up and leave to minister. No, no one will. That's a thing of the past. And so, God, you can understand why when we get into the Laodicean church, why we're in the shape we're in today. We, and not only that, let me just be frank. You can't get parents to let go of their children. We say we want our children to serve God. We want, we want, but we want them to serve and love God under our leadership. So what would you do if your son or daughter said, listen, I feel the calling of God to preach the gospel. I feel the calling of God to go to India and preach the gospel. I feel the calling of God to leave this country and go to Iran and preach the gospel. You, what you as a parent do? You better think about that before you answer because the evidence says you would not. Mm -hmm. The evidence says you would not. It's time that this church, and you're going to, well, that's for next week. I'm not going to do it. So let's kind of look on. There's, Christ's nature is revealed to this church as we move on. He reminds them that he is holy. Be ye holy, for I am holy, First Peter said. This church is separated from the world to holiness. They now love God and they see the word and they see what God wants them to do. And so they separate themselves from the world. They lay aside every weight and every sin, as the book of Hebrews tells us, to follow. Jesus reveals himself to be true. Uh, Vernon J. McGee said this one time, true means genuine with the added note of perfection and completeness. He adds that Moses did not give the true bread. Christ is the true bread. Christ gives you the truth. We, Christ is not only the truth. He's the ultimate truth. He is truth. He is the only truth. And until this world recognizes the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ, we will continue to flounder as we seek our own truth. He that hath the key of David is an obvious reference to the authority of Christ. He is saying that he, it, he is forecasting here when he will be the rightful ruler of this world. Remember that when Jesus is introduced to us in the Gospels, he is somebody that no one desires. He is a, in human form. He is not beautiful. He is not, he is not uh, something that you would long for. But in the book of Revelation, we the true Christ is revealed, and we see him in his power and his glory. So he has the authority. He rules the world, the song goes, with truth and grace. He gives latitude to the rulers of this world, but he will eventually bring the whole world into his authority. He openeth the door, and no man shutteth and no man opened it. So he says, when he says, go into all the world and preach the gospel, he literally means for you to go into all the world and preach the gospel. Your life should be secondary to your faith in Christ. Let me tell you what God has done. And I know that we're fuss, we fuss, we, we hate COVID-19, we wish it would go away. And uh, But let me tell you what God has done by putting churches online, mm -hmm. okay? Guys like me, and I'm, 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 okay, so you can't get mad at me for talking about me. 
I've been revealed. No matter what I was doing before COVID-19, coming online every day, talking about the Bible, singing the songs of God, I am now revealed to the whole world. I can't run. I can't hide. I, I, there's nowhere to go. I now, no matter what happens after today, every relative I have, every friend I have, every relationship I have knows now about my relationship with Christ and what I believe about Christ. Now you think about that. You're revealed just as well. When you sign on to this program, you're telling your friends and everyone who sees this program what you believe. So Christ has opened the door to where you, we, no one can any longer hide behind their faith. You are revealed. And I thought that, boy, the other day that, that came to me and I thought, wow, I get it now. And we're reaching people that we couldn't reach before because they were homebound. People are being reached for the first time in a long time. And, and the gospel it go, is go, goes on. Because God is not confined to a church building. We are the church. God, as pastor said, is not confined to a box. Mm -hmm. C.S. Lewis said... He is not a tame lion. You cannot tame him. And so God has really, so he's opened doors, trying to get his gospel out there through his children. And he is really saying to you today and to me, it's time to do something because I'm going to open and reveal who you are. And I'm going to show the world, choose you this day who you will serve. So it is a challenge. And the, in fact, Revelation verse 3, 7 is really a challenge of God to open his word to for the people of God to trust him and preach the gospel without fear and without reservation. And so we need to trust God and not be afraid to share our faith. So that's what, that's kind of, and I'm moving quickly because I really don't want to spend two weeks here. I want to move, okay? So his commendation is, I know your works. So I'm setting before you an open door. And we've talked about that. The apostle Peter, Paul considered an open door an opportunity for Christian service. When God opens the door, you've got a choice. I had a choice. When, 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 when uh, Irma said, I think you can do this. I had a choice. When pastor said, let's move Sunday school to online. I had a choice. And now I don't have a choice. I'm out there. So you see, God set before you and me an open door. You have a little strength. What he's saying here is, I know you're the minority. Let me tell you something, folks. If you're a Christian today, you are a minority. Amen. I'm not talking about a Christian in word. I'm not talking about a hearer. I'm talking about a doer. If you are a born-again child of God with your life surrendered to Christ, you're in the minority today. And so what he's saying is, I know that you have a little strength, but hold on. Hold on. Hold fast to what you have because it's going to pay off for you in eternity. Uh, that age, Philadelphia's church age is characterized by small congregations they are not big, elaborate churches, although Philadelphia is a very wealthy city. But the Holy Spirit and Jesus says to us, when you are weak, I am strong. I will show you my strength through your weakness. So that is amazing. And you have not, you've kept my word. Listen, people who keep the word of God are people who are not hearers of the word, but they're doers of the word. And they trust God, and they trust God's word. And I'm going to, and you haven't denied my name. And they haven't compromised my, my, my commandments. Have you denied the name of Christ? Let me warn you, if you have, he said he would deny you before his father. 
So it is important that even though the crowd goes this way, even though the world goes this way, that you follow Christ and that you don't deny his name. Your life, be it short or long, your life is going to be determined on how much you trust and love and follow Christ. You can live for years, but if you deny Christ, you will lose eternity. I would rather live here a short time and honor the name of Christ and keep his name and, and proclaim it before the world and live with him in eternity in heaven than I would to own all this world and its money. They refuse to deny the name of their God. And so that's promised. Now, here's what he says. He's going to make a promise to this church because of what you've done. I will take those who are of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. I will make them come and worship before thy feet to know what that I have loved thee. Now he's not talking about worshiping you, but they will, the day will come when he will bring our enemies to our feet and acknowledge that Jesus loved you that he is the almighty God, that he is the creator of the universe, that he did give his life for, for, for the world and died and was buried and resurrected, rose and from the grave and is coming again. And they will recognize that Christ loved you. Amen. He is prom promising that all false religions, all these who claim to be of God, but they're not, they will be brought to his feet. And in per they will realize that in persecuting you, they have turned their back on the living God. Because, here's a beautiful one, oh my goodness. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I will keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon the, all the world to try them which dwell upon the earth. This is important, and this may be the only thing I get out, because it's 952. This is direct communication to this church of Philadelphia. You are not going to go into the tribulation period. Because you have kept my word, I will keep you from the hour of temptation, which will come upon the whole world. Listen, that event, that tribulation period has never come. The world has never known a worldwide tribulation period. Never. Not the whole world. So that is speaking in the future. And the, the church of Philadelphia is promised that they will not see that hour of trial and tribulation. They will be kept from it by the rapture of the church. That also means the saints in the Laodicean age, because remember, the Philadelphia church carries right down into Laodicea. Even though the church becomes weak and with almost no power, that remnant of that belongs to Christ, that still surrender their hearts to him, God has promised them they will not see the hour or the trial of temptation that will come upon the whole earth. There is no other way to describe this verse. And so this is just one of many verses that says to you, as a Christian, you will not see the tribulation period. I am coming to take you. And I will do that when, when as, he, as he talks about in the scripture through the apostle Paul, that the dead in Christ shall rise first. And those of us that are alive and remain shall be caught up together to meet the Lord in the air not on the earth, in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Keep in mind that when we get past the church of Laodicea and John gets that historic call to come to heaven, the church is no more. You will also see that once that happens, we the events that unfold from that point are in heaven and you'll see that the Holy Spirit is in heaven and not here on the earth. And that is another 
another cause to make us understand that the church and the Holy Spirit will be gone at the rapture of the church. And we'll get more into that as we get into chapters 4, 5, and 6. So it can be, it's not that difficult to understand if you just read it literally and, and understand that he means what he says. Believe the word of God. You're not going through the tribulation period. Now, there are people out there that want you to believe that you are, but they are false teachers. Let me just help you with that. They're false teachers. You are not, you are saved from the wrath to come. So that, and it's 9.55. Let me see what else I have to cover. Uh, the promises. Remember that Christ says to him, Behold, I come quickly. Hold fast to what you have, that no man take your crown. Do not surrender the gospel. Do not surrender the name of Christ. Do not surrender. You've lost a lot of things. You're not getting back. But what you better not surrender is the word of God and the truth and the commandments of God. And don't surrender the Holy Spirit that dwells within you to somehow fit in with this world. Let me promise you, you are not going to fit in with this world. Light has no part of darkness. Amen. You cannot fit in, so let it go. You cannot compromise. Let it go. Be a Christian. Be a child of God. Believe the Bible above everything. His challenge, with four minutes left to go, he that overcometh, I'll make him a pillar in the temple of God. That means you are going to be a ruler and reigning in heaven with Christ. You can see my notes so I don't have to go all about. I will write upon him the name of God the name of my God and the name of that city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, God is going to give you a seal and a name that will allow you to have entrance into New Jerusalem. God is saying you're going to have a passport. So you don't have to ask, can I come in? You don't even have to knock at the door. He's going to put a seal on you that says to everyone who sees it, this is a child of God and this is is his home. He's going to hand you that title. Amen. And Jesus says, I will write upon him my new name. We always talk about ours having a new name written down in glory. No, no, no. It's Christ's new name. And that is a king and savior and ruler and reigner and king of kings and Lord of lords. It won't be like that sign they put on the cross, king of the Jews. No, this is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. And he promises that he will give you his name. And all those years that we worshiped him in spirit and in truth through the word of God, we will now worship him face to face. The promise is to you that you have free entrance into that holy city, that you will have the name of God, the seal of God on you, and you will worship Jesus face to face. Amen. You shall behold him. Praise God. And everything you went through in this life, whether you're suffering from cancer, whether you're suffering from an illness or a disease or a lifelong injury, whether you're suffering persecution, whether you're living in a hole in the wall, it doesn't matter when you see Jesus face to face and you worship him face to face at the feet of Jesus, it will be worth it all. You, the what Paul called and C.S. Lewis called the weight of glory. You'll carry your burden throughout this life, but one day that burden will roll off your back Amen. like water off a duck's back, Amen. and you will be face to face with the glory of Jesus Christ. Whew. Boy, we've covered a lot in that. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Let us pray, and then we'll make an announcement. Father in heaven, thank you, Lord, for this study. Thank you for the burning of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Lord, for what you mean to us and how we long and look forward to the day when we look at you 
face to face. When we can finally let our burdens down and worship at your feet and praise you for the first million years for what you've done for us and given us access into that beautiful city that you prepared for us. Bless the worship service today, Lord. Let the word of God go out and let it anoint and bring and convict and bring sinners to Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. God bless you, folks. Uh, this is going to be available on a uh, Root Services page and on YouTube as well if you want to go back and listen again. But worship service today is at 11 o'clock at the Root Free Will Baptist Church. You can physically go to church today. Uh, we ask you to please follow the CDC guidelines. Please put that mask on in your car. Wear it throughout the process, throughout the worship service, and then don't take it off, please, until you get back in your car. God has been so good to our church. Not one case of COVID-19 yet in our church, and that is all due to the glory of God. So please be careful and use wisdom. We're also going to be on Rouge Services' Facebook page, live streamed, Rouge Services' YouTube, and we're also on Twitter, at Rouge FWB Church. So God bless you. Thank you for joining us this morning. May God bless your Sunday. We'll see you at 11 o'clock for morning worship. And then we'll be right back here with you tomorrow morning, God willing, at 10 o'clock for our praise and worship hour at 10 o'clock. God bless you. Have a wonderful day.